Do you look at the chicken trucks on your way to work and think, ooh, delicious. <laughs> Do you look at the hog farms and the filths they live in and say, mm, can't wait till one of their legs gets ripped off so I can eat it. Hi everyone. <clears throat> Welcome back to my channel, Talk Nerdy To Me. Glad you found me, I'm glad you're here. As you can see, I need to do some drywall behind me. Please don't fault me for the state of my house and my backgrounds. We'll try to get it, we'll try to get it better for you. I hope this finds you well. How's everyone doing? Uh, today I thought we would start um, talking about something that's very close to my heart, it's very dear to me. A lot of people find it like a trigger word, but it's veganism. And somehow, I don't know if you might make this connection, but this will take us back to the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. So let's get started and we'll figure, figure this out. What is this veganism? So a lot of people have heard of this as a diet, okay? It is the original diet that we were given by God in Genesis. Uh, it's the diet that they were under all before the flood and it is what we biologically are made to digest, which is plants, plant-based diet. Okay, you can find this in Genesis. It tells us that every herb of the field, every tree producing fruit is for our food and that the grasses of the field would be the food for the animals. We were not instructed to ever eat the animals and the only time we ever made a sacrifice was after the fall. So if you're not Christian, if you're not familiar with these concepts, I'm sure you may have heard of them. We have Adam and Eve placed in paradise garden on earth that has many trees and fruits to partake of. There's no shortage of knowledge in the garden. There's all these trees full of knowledge that Adam and Eve partook in, ate. There was no problem with that. There were two trees in the garden, and this was made known to Adam and Eve by God directly. Do not eat of these trees. And these trees were the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Now, we're not sure if Adam and Eve even knew where the tree of life was. They also knew that they were not supposed to partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil any of the other trees of knowledge, go for it. They had all kinds of knowledge available to them. They had all kinds of other trees available to them that we aren't told about. They were talking directly to God. God was walking in the garden with them. They had as much knowledge as they could possibly want, right? <clears throat> they were also immortal. So, they had not yet taken part of the tree of life, but we are to gather from the scriptures that the tree of life would eventually be given to them if they remained in God's will, which is staying away from this one tree, right? So we've all heard of the temptation in the fall. This is when the devil himself, the original liar, comes to Eve and presents her with a, a, a bunch of, of questions and a bunch of suppositions in just one sentence. At first, he questions the sovereignty of God. Did God really say? Then he basically says that God is wrong. Oh, you won't die if you eat of this fruit. God said that you would die, but you won't. And then um, he basically says, questions the sovereignty of God, that God doesn't, God just doesn't want you to do that because he knows that you would become like him knowing good and evil. <sighs> so that's a very clever way to approach someone, this brand new human who doesn't find it strange that an animal is talking to her, that a snake is communicating with her how would she find it strange she's the f she's 
the second human. They don't know what normal is. <laughs> so she doesn't find this strange. She talks back to the snake and eventually eats of the fruit. She is taken by his deception. And nothing happens in the garden. There's no changes. She's eating the fruit. She's, it's, she finds that it was good to eat and she ate it. This is not when the fall happens. Now the ancient Greeks want to say that that's Pandora. She brought all the sin that there is into the world. She, it's her, it's her fault. Um, not the snake's fault. Not Adam's fault, it's Eve's fault. Now, we see that that's not true because there was no changes in the garden until Adam eats the fruit. When Adam sees that the fruit is good for him and eats of it, a change comes and they have the knowledge of good and evil and they they become afraid they see themselves as naked okay so this is one of my favorite parts of the Bible when God is walking in the garden and he can't find his humans they're hiding from him and he, he knows that they're hiding. He knows what they've done. But he gives them a chance to come to him humbly and repent. Now, he asks, you know, what are you doing? Like, why, why are you hiding your face? And Adam and Eve proclaim that they, they're naked. And God, of course, in his wisdom, asks them, who told you that you were naked? Now this is a major crux in the Bible. This is a major turning point that leads to the thesis statement of the Bible in Genesis 3.15. <laughs> I, I posit that before our nakedness, before our sin, before this fall, we had a covering, and that this covering was as the image of God is. Jesus describes it as the lily's clothing, right? It's just, it's just there. It's just, you, the lily is not naked. Animals, animals are not naked either. Um, but let's get back to the garden for now. They're naked. God provides for them a covering. And this is the first killing. This is the first killing of our era, the Adamic line, is the sacrifice that was made so that Adam and Eve could have clothing. Because before they were covering themselves with leaves, they felt very self-conscious before God. They had this new awareness of their covering being gone. Now, some people will say, well, they were, they were clothed in light before the fall. And this is very beautiful to me. I think that that's amazing. Uh, we see God pictured as being clothed in light on his throne. He, he is a pillar of flame. Um, he has an eminence of rainbows and beautiful, you know, sunshine. The sun is his chariot. Um, we see that he is a being of light an actual light bearer <laughs> um, and us being made in the image of God we can posit that Adam and Eve may have had uh, an, a glow an eminence of light around them before the fall I think that's very beautiful <clears throat> um, we see that animals uh, they they don't talk anymore. Um, they are not given to the original humans biologically as food. They are not sinners. They didn't eat of the fruit of the tree. They are innocents. They are meek. They are um, weak. 
weaker than us. We are to have dominion over these beings. We gave them their names. Adam gave them their names. He created, you know, God created taxonomy when he told Adam to name the animals. Um, animals uh, serve as not only companions to man, but they are, they help him to work the land, which is necessary after the fall. Another point I want to bring up before we really get into the discussion of veganism is that the plants after the fall were corrupted. Now we're told that after the fall, man had to work the land to get food. There was no more garden. He was out of there. So he had to make a farm. He had to grow uh, with agriculture. <clears throat> And that, this became hard. It wasn't just easy anymore. There were thorns and thistles that came about in the earth at that time as well. And this has been very beautiful to me in my learning of these things about the garden in the fall and how they relate to our biology. Because Jesus, when he died, he wore the crown of thorns. Thorns, the thorns represent that God, God, Jesus, has redeemed not only us with his death, he's made us redeemable, but that he has made the plants redeemable as well. And that the thorns and thistles in his new Jerusalem will most likely be blossoms. They, we won't have to have, we won't have thorns and thistles anymore. We will be in the beautiful paradise uh, that God made the earth for us for and that this is possible because Jesus has died also to redeem the plant kingdom now okay so he redeemed us by dying for our sins on the cross and he placed there was a thorn of crowns a crown of thorns on his head as he was crucified signifying the fallen nature of the plant kingdom as well and that he was redeeming it as well, or that he would make it redeemable. Okay? To me, that's a beautiful concept. I wanted to mention it here because this just, it can, you can get really deep into that. Um, actual thorns, uh, scientifically, is a bud. It should have been a bud, and it should have been a flower. But instead, the plant's DNA and its genetics decide that it's gonna be a thorn. <clears throat> and this is a judgment on the plant kingdom because of the fruit that Eve partook of. Now, <laughs> this can get a little deep, so I'm just going to try to keep it more surface level. But we see that this plant kingdom is not innocent. The snake provided the impetus to eat the plant but the eating of the plant and you know you might think of when the woman eats the cake the program in the matrix that the Merovingian has provided to her she eats the cake she has the orgasm and she she is changed okay by this food by this sustenance that she chooses to put into her mouth now Eve was sustained by the fruit. She was also changed by the fruit. And in God's kingdom, this plant kingdom is now fallen. And we see that by the thorns and thistles growing on the earth, the ground not being fruitful. It has to be tilled and sowed and man's will has to act on it for it to be able to produce sustenance now. It doesn't just do it automatically. It doesn't do it through the perfect will of God. It is fallen. But it is redeemable through Jesus. So I wanted to talk about now how the animals, the animal kingdom, is not fallen and is not, does not need to be redeemed now, how can, we, how can we know this? So, animals, the first thing I see when I look at animals is I see a companion. I see a very meek and 
Now, I'm not talking. I'm not talking about all the predators here. I know that predators aren't meek at the moment, but we are told that in the perfect paradise, they will again eat hay and straw, and they will lay down with children and lambs, and be totally docile. Now, them changing their diet doesn't make them fallen. The animals had to have something to eat after the flood as well. And we were given these new laws after the flood to eat and partake of animals because there was no, nothing else to eat on the earth at that time. There was no vegetation yet. Okay? <clears throat> so, it was not just man who was given the animals to eat at the time of the flood. It was the animals too. Now, there's a lot of controversy around these statements that I'm making, but I urge you to go to the Bible, ask for Holy Spirit, and understand these things deeply. Sorry, my nose is running a little cold today. It's winter here in the South. That means it's about 60 degrees. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but animals as a whole, we are given dominion over them. We have power over them that they just can't, they can't fight. Like, even a man can go kill a lion, a tiger, a bear. We have the ability. They are not forming weapons against us. They are not plotting against us. Okay? Now, they may run and hide, but they don't wage war on us. Now, you could say that the plants do. <laughs> the plants can be invasive. Of course, animals can be invasive, too, to the environment. But they're not really challenging our dominion at all. The plants, if you've ever had a garden, you know that they challenge you. <laughs> and it's hard to grow the things that you need to eat. Animals also have their covering. They never lost their covering. They're not naked. As, as we did at the time of the fall. We also see that animals do not have grievous pain in childbirth. I've witnessed this firsthand at births. Uh, horses, cats, dogs. It's more of an ecstasy. It is not a pain. It's not a panic. It's not a grueling experience. It is just natural. It happens. It's over. The animals go on, they walk around, they go away, they, they walk off, they're fine. The mother is fine, unless there's some strange complication with an outside impetus affecting her pregnancy. Even then, she doesn't suffer pain in childbirth. Now there are contractions, you can see the contractions happening, especially on elephants, larger animals. The animal does not scream, the animal does not you know, it's not terrified, it's not you know, writhing in pain, and we see the animals do writhe and scream when they're in pain. They try to escape, they try to fight back if they're being killed or hurt or maimed. So the judgments that came upon the earth after the fall, I posit, did not apply to animals. They have their covering. Let me grab an animal. <laughs> Come here, animal. <laughs> he still has his covering. He's not naked. This is much. His name is Ziggy. Because he's made of dots. <laughs> he's all dots. <laughs> but even a carnivore like this, he's not. He doesn't know the law. And this is the meaning of innocence. It's not that you don't kill, it's not that you don't steal, it's not that you don't do anything. You don't know the law. Lawless for the lawless. It's not for the innocent. The innocent don't know any law. They have no knowledge of it. It's not, they haven't eaten of this fruit. They don't know what good and evil is. So it doesn't apply to them. Isn't that right? Tell them. Doesn't he look like smudge? I told you! <laughs> but how does that relate to veganism? What is this all about? 
Should everyone be a vegan? Is it really the biological diet? In my opinion, as I've said before, this is all my opinion. I'm not lying. I'm just going on the best information that I have and the Holy Spirit and keeping in prayer and keeping in the the bread of life and the word that we are to protect the meek. We are to protect the orphans, the widows, of course. But why would we go and slaughter something if we don't have to? So this is the question that vegans pose a lot. And not just, you know, the health conscious or, you know, whatever. I want to I want to talk more about the the ones who are vegans because they understand that we love animals. They're our companions. We see a dolphin on television and we just we love it. We want to go swim with it. Um naturally as as having a child's heart so i'm not speaking of people who are out of god's will who are um you know proclaim themselves as you know murderers or um they just want to be carnivores they're like lions you know they want to get back to the uh the diet that we had as cavemen well all that comes from misinformation and I want to direct you right now, if you haven't seen it, it's known as The Best Speech Ever. It's by Gary Rosky. I'll link it up here. I always choose the wrong side, but I'm just gonna stay with it, just right up here. <laughs> and um, he brings out that biologically, the way that we are made in our cells, in our DNA, the language of us, <clears throat> is herbivore or more specifically frugivore like our most close dna um, relatives here on earth relatives the great apes the monkeys the orangutans the gorillas um these creatures we see a lot of similarities in them they have posable thumbs, they have family, family structure, they have different clans and neighborhoods, they eat mostly fruit, uh, they eat some bugs. Of course, if they are starving, they're going to eat whatever they can. But biologically, their gut and their gut bacteria and their intestines, all the way in their digestive tract, is made for fruit and fruit you know, some vegetables, some insects. We are very similar to these animals. <laughs> we are supposed to see these similarities. We do see these similarities in science. We talk about it a lot, how close a relative the giant apes are, the gorillas, the orangutans. We know this, we know that we're close to them. We can see uh, when Coco learned sign language, uh, when she had a baby kitten, how she could have the propensity for empathy like we do um, not all animals have that so I want to talk about our biological system a little bit just like Gary Yarofsky does that I mentioned before and these are the these are the arguments that I think more vegans should be familiar with and use so humans Across the board, all humans have these same dietary innards, okay? We have the same innards, unless you have some kind of strange mutation, which is not part of uh, actual creation. It's part of the fall. It's part of um, oxidation. It's part of uh, toxins. It's part of uh, some kind of radioactive... Um, stuff that was going on while you were in the womb. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about actually our biology, the way we understand it as humans, as it is in an anatomy and physiology book. So, our intestines, I'll start there, start at the end, are very long. 
and this is much different than what we see in the omnivore uh, classification and in the carnivore classification. Their intestines, now this is compared to spinal length. I'm not just going on, oh, your intestines are longer than a, a kitty cat. Oh, no. <laughs> compared to your, the length of your spine and the length of their spine, your intestines are much longer than a carnivore or an omnivore because a carnivore and an omnivore have to get that rotting meat out of them before it brings all kinds of sickness and virus and whatever. They want to get that meat digested and out because it is rotting in there. <laughs> they have the ability to digest this because they have different digestive enzymes, they have different saliva, they have different taste buds as well, which we'll get into in a minute. Now, carnivores in general have descendant canines. Us as humans, we do not have descendant canines. We have canines, but they don't go down any further than our incisors, usually. If they do, it's just very small. Sometimes, you know, you'll have a little bit of descendants in some people. Um, and this, I do believe, is just natural uh, adaptation to a current uh, poisonous diet and causes some of the mutations that we see in humanity. Uh, I want to talk that, about the fact that we do not have meat sensing taste buds in our mouth. Okay, so my cat has meat sensing taste buds on his tongue. We don't. We don't produce the same kind of salival enzymes as carnivores or omnivores do. Another thing biologically, omnivores and carnivores, slaughter makes them salivate. Okay, they get excited when something is being killed. Okay, we, we don't have that that reaction to death. If if there was a deer being killed and skinned where you could hear it, where you could hear its moans and its cries in the restaurant that you were eating in, would it make you hungry? Now I want you to really think about that. You may tell yourself, oh yeah, oh yeah, I love that. I love killing animals. Does it make you salivate? Does it does seeing the blood and the guts and hearing the cries of this dying animal make you salivate. Okay. So, we talked about animals being innocent. We talked about um, a little bit about biological veganism. <clears throat> I want you to look into that. I want you to really think about why we are made that way. Why we don't have to kill anything to live. Now, a few years ago, there was a movie called The Cove. It won an Oscar, it had a lot of critical acclaim, and it was about the slaughter of dolphins off of the Japanese coast and in the Pacific Rim area, about how dolphins were being killed systematically, driven into this certain cove, and totally wiped out this whole, you know, whatever pod they could force into this cove was killed right there. A net was dropped on the out of, outside of the cove. Boats came in. The dolphins were beaten, sawed in half in front of their family. Horrible, okay? Very horrible. If you've never watched this movie, I promise you it will make you cry. Um, we are meant to feel empathy for these creatures. We are, we were a part of their family, okay? We had covering. We have the ability to care for others, just as animals do. They care for their families. They don't want to die. They want to live simply and peacefully. 
on their own in their clan in their neighborhood by and large they don't just go and wage war on other clans unless there's territory disputes or <laughs> or their house cats and they just wage war on your kitchen island <laughs> come on shadow come on shadow she's up on the couch now she's happy um try to let you see what else to make you me. So <laughs> everything's falling because I'm moving these around. Um this is Ziggy that we met before. This is this is Nicholas, his dad. This is Peanut, the little Chewini that you saw in my video. I'll post it right up here. He's got all, over thirty seven thousand views right now. His tricks. This is him. He's being a lazy boy today. And over there is Miss Shadow. She's the sweetest dog in the world. And there's more cats around here. There's random, random animals everywhere. We have a bearded dragon as well. We do love animals here. Another reason why we choose not to eat them. <laughs> um, now, I want to make this very clear. I'm not saying that eating animals is a sin. Okay, I want that to be very clear. <laughs> I'm not saying that eating animals is a sin. Because a lot of people will get up in arms and say, Oh, you can't take my, you can't take my fish. You can't take my chicken wings. <laughs> and they get very upset, especially this time of year. Super Bowl Sunday is coming up. We're going to have a lot of party, partying, a lot of chicken wing eating around the United States. So I want to make it very clear, it's not a sin. However, I want to ask you to think deeply about this. Is eating animals right? Because we know that we learned good and evil in the garden. God wasn't just kidding about it being the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When Eve took in that fruit, it changed her. It, it made her lose her covering in some way. And she knew that there was a knowledge that came into her, that she knew the difference. Now, it's not saying that she was like God. She was like God before. All right, she was made in the image of God. She was like God before. She was, she had everlasting life before. She just hadn't realized it through obedience to God. So, this eating of the fruit is, is symbolic in some ways and it's totally real in other ways. We now know through the teachings of our forefathers, including Adam and Eve, and all the forefathers of ours that came after them in the Adamic line. We know this good and evil from our forefathers. Okay? Now, we're not taught this in school, in Catholic school. We're not asked to think about this. So it may be new to some of you. Would you go out right now in your yard, dig around, and find a rabbit to kill and strangle and eat it? Or would you, you know, instead, would you rather go to the store and buy a chicken breast or something that's already been slaughtered? There's no blood, you don't have to see any violence. Okay, so your dog or your pig or your chicken doesn't have this knowledge. It just goes and eats the mouse or the rat or the lizard or whatever's available. It just eats it with its teeth, bones and all, skin, everything, just eat it. Can we do that? Is that part of our biology? Can we go out and kill a squirrel 
Can I go out right now? This squirrel that's in the tree up there, can I go kill it with my bare hands and eat it with just my claws and my teeth? And not have to, not use a knife, not skin it, not cook it, just eat it. Because this is the natural world. This is what we look at when we look at biology, is nature. How are, how are things made? How, how do they function? What is their function? Are my nails meant to tear an animal limb from limb? These little, these little nails? Are my teeth? My jaw goes this way. There's no omnivore that can do that. Okay? Only the herbivore's jaw moves like that. Lateral movement. All of your omnivores, carnivores, only have open and closed. Open and closed. They don't go unless something's broken. <laughs> Okay, they only have, their mandible only goes one way. Why is that? Okay, why, why don't, why don't our stomachs have the specific acids they need to break down flesh? Okay, so a lot of people will point to the story of Peter. And I'm thinking it's in Romans, but it may be in Acts. I'm pretty sure it's in Romans. I'm really bad at putting things on the screen, guys. So <laughs> I'll put it in the description box below. But Peter is having to go and eat after Jesus' death. He's having to go and eat at this Roman's house, a Roman household. And in the Roman household, it is acceptable to eat pork, to eat all kinds of meat, and it's just normal to them in the days and times right after Jesus. And Peter is going to have to go eat with them because he's going to go share the, the word with them. He's going to go um, be an apostle and share and participate in the Great Commission that Jesus gave him. He's going to go share his faith, share the word with these people. And God presents him with a vision of all these animals being slaughtered and he says you know go and slaughter go and eat the meat and a lot of people will say you know obviously that says you know God's okay with eating meat yes absolutely well Peter of course is like no I don't want to do that I've never eaten meat I don't I hate this I don't want to do that and three times God presents him with the same vision of slaughtering and eating the meat take the meat and eat now, I want to let you know that this is not God saying, I'm going to change your biology. God didn't change the length of Peter's intestines when he told him this. God is telling him to go and eat this meat and go and partake so that he will not be a stumbling block to these Romans who are going to accept this apostle into their household and hear what he has to say. We don't need the confusion that would come with Peter not being able to eat with them because they're going to have all kinds of meats, probably in everything, just like it is now, just like it is now. Meat is in everything you would find on a normal dinner table. It's in the soup, it's in the stock, it's in the beans, it's in the veggies, it's everywhere. You can't get away from it. And God knew this. God knew that the Romans were, were going to be eating like this. He knew that Peter would be disgusted. <laughs> and so he tells him, you know, <clears throat> don't make this an issue. This is not the issue. And it's not. Um, however, I just want to be make sure that you are thinking about these things and thinking about why. Why? Why should we eat meat? Is it good for us? Does it bring us health and prosperity in our body? Does it encourage, you know, an alkaline, you know, antioxidant environment? 
Well, no, we know that it doesn't. Um, it causes inflammation. It causes, in many cases, heart disease, uh, a buildup of cholesterol because we are actually taking in another animal's proteins, another animal's DNA, which is foreign to our body. Uh, this is where a lot of the autoimmune disorders come from, is foreign proteins coming through the gut lining, which has been torn by these huge animal, you know, animals that are huge, like cows, um, especially cows, uh, pigs even. These huge proteins tearing the lining of our intestines, coming into the bloodstream, and then you have foreign proteins in your body, your body has to react. Right. <clears throat> All right, guys. <laughs> Told you it's getting a little hot. So, I really just want you to think about all of that and to think why God did not give us animals to eat in the beginning. We had the fruit of the earth, any plant bearing seed and uh, that bears fruit, um, any, any green thing uh, of the land was given to you as food. Um, we, we posited that the covering was what we lost when we became naked in the garden. Our light covering or eminence of um, some kind of spiritual glow that we had before the fall is what we lost. We also mentioned that animals did not lose their innocence at this time. The plant kingdom is held as, you know, contemptuous. Uh, Jesus wore the crown of thorns to, to represent that the plant kingdom could be redeemed, uh, but that it was, it was to an in fact fallen that the animal kingdom is not fallen they still have their covering they don't experience pain in childbirth they don't have to have agriculture to live the earth provides for them the fall of course is free choice we've talked about that a lot here on the channel free choice is a gift from god it's a beautiful, wonderful gift from God that he gave us from get-go, from Adam, uh, to use our discernment. Um, that yes, we could be fooled, we could be deceived, uh, but there was, like I said, the thesis statement of the Bible, there was a Redeemer planned even then, which Eve thought was Cain, but of course was Jesus much later. So, have you ever ridiculed a vegan? Have you ever thought um, that killing an animal was wrong? Do you look at the chicken trucks on your way to work and think, ooh, delicious? <laughs> Do you look at the hog farms and the filths they live in and say, mm, can't wait till one of their legs gets ripped off so I can eat it? Is that your nature? And I want you to look at that and say, you know, am I, do I salivate? Am I turned on by an animal's throat being slit? And I know most of you out there are going to say, no, of course not. I, I would feel deep empathy for that animal. I wouldn't want to hear it scream. I wouldn't want to see its blood pour out. I wouldn't want to see it seize up in convulsions of death. That's horrible to us. That's terrifying. It's horrific. Uh, other animals that are made to watch slaughters are horrified as well. They cry, they they leave, they they mourn. Uh, other animals when they see them die. Uh, I want to say to you that if you haven't thought about these things, you know, vegans have a reason. The the heartfelt vegans, anyway, <laughs> not the ones. Uh, who just want to get in your face and make you feel bad. <laughs> but the ones who love animals, who feel a deep empathy for other creatures, 
are going to say, number one, we don't need to eat dead flesh. We were never commanded to do so. Uh, we didn't go and we, we weren't commanded to when we were going to preach to the Romans. You know, um, we use that as an example, of course, when we go into other people's homes to not make it a stumbling block that keeps us from sharing the word or that, you know, makes it difficult for people to accept the word from us because we're ridiculing them about their diet. That's not what it's about. It's not what it's supposed to be about. But I would like to say that the entire Bible will reinforce the importance of taking care of the weak, giving, giving care to the, to the meek, taking care of those that are weaker and smaller and more insignificant than you, because you do have dominion over the earth. You should use it in a way that proclaims God's kingdom, that shows his love for you by you having love for other creatures. So this video got kind of long. I, I hope I covered everything I wanted to. I hope that you had a few light bulbs there maybe, um, especially with uh, Jesus's crown of thorns and the plant kingdom being fallen because of Eve eating the fruit. It was a judgment on the plant kingdom as well. Um, again, law is for the lawless. It's not for the innocent. Um, it's one of my favorite sayings of all time because we know if you don't know about the law, you can't follow it. And that's what we're here for. We're here to teach the gospel, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and his holy name and his works here on earth and what he taught us and how he made us. So <clears throat> share this video. Give me a thumbs up. If you'd like to debate, please comment down below. I'm here. I'm a nerd. Come talk to me. Have a great day.